All right, so hi guys. Just a couple of things before the actual panel. Uh, first off, this is a very shortened presentation of a 30-page undergrad paper that I wrote while I was still in school. So if you're a nerd and you want to see the super detailed version of this presentation, I, I included a link to the PDF down below. And then the second thing, uh, yeah, there were some technical difficulties with this. So I had this awesome volunteer, Xavier. He was, oh, seriously, guys, he was so great. He was my volunteer, and so he actually did the PowerPoint for me, and he recorded the video. But we really didn't have a rehearsal, so that's why uh, the PowerPoint slides might be a little ill-timed, or the video started super late. Uh, that's, sorry, that's because there's no rehearsal for this. So, yeah. And because the recording of the panel started a little late, uh, you guys kind of missed the introduction where I actually said the definition of what a parasocial relationship actually is. So here's that definition right now on screen. Boom. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful definition. Textbook. Perfect. Awesome. So yeah, if you want, check out the 30-page undergrad paper down below. If not, uh, continue on with the show. Or do both. Uh, whatever. Enjoy my panel. Bye. Uh, parasocial interaction theory was first proposed by two guys, Horton and Wool, in 1956 with the advent of television and radio personality. And the interesting thing about this theory, too, is that most communication theories usually get redefined every couple years or so with the introduction of more communication methods. But with this theory, it's only been around since the 1950s, and then there's a 50-year gap, and then now in the new age of the internet and social media. Uh, so that was really fun to explain to my undergrad professor when I had this huge 50 year gap in my first research. Uh, one of my favorite characters from this era was Lonesome Gal. Uh, Lonesome Gal always did all of her productions in the second person, as in, hey you, hey baby, how are you doing sweetie? And she basically acted like her audience was her boyfriend. Uh, of course the purpose of this was as a Bond Company tobacco sponsorship. So literally every sentence she had was Honey, if you just smoked Bond tobacco, you would be the love of my life. So it was very interesting that she was able to make a sponsorship deal into something that a lot of guys at the time related to. So the benefits of a parasocial relationship are that, for the creator, it's a lot of money for them. Uh, brands with successful parasocial relationships get anywhere from $40,000 per YouTube video to $5,000 per Instagram post. This is only the successful influencers. Lesser influencers with like 5,000 to 10,000 followers can get a little bit less than that. Uh, and the super successful ones can get up to millions and millions of it. Another thing is that they also get money from merchandise, uh, fan letters. I've seen celebrities that successfully initiate a parasocial relationship that would receive money from people because they wanted people, they had a lunch show. And so people send them money to go get lunch with their money. So it's just free money. And then also, they are way more successful than traditional celebrities online. They get three times as many views, two times as many actions, and 12 times as many comments on a video. So this is basically Clint Eastwood versus The Rock. If you notice The Rock, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, he gets millions and millions of views, like the Rock versus Siri promos that's going on right now. That's a result of his successful parasocial relationship. So someone else like Brad Pitt attempted to do that, he would not get as nearly as many views or hits. Now for the audience, you don't get as much money, I'm sorry. But you do get a connection. Uh, whether it's especially uh, beneficial if you are someone who's lonely or is not good at making friends, uh, a parasocial relationship with a celebrity could help you develop the skills you need to make friends or to emulate a friendship so you don't feel as lonely or you don't feel as alone in the world. Uh, there's also personal gratification, social identification. Uh, if you identify with a celebrity, that is somewhat different. Like, if you are a young teenager trying to find your sexual identity and you identify with a gay actor, that could help you identify more and be more proud about that uh, homosexual relationship that you want. Uh, and then the audience, the important thing is too, is that the audience actually holds power in the relationship. It's not on a celebrity. Even though the celebrity gets all the money and all the fame, it's the audience that decides whether or not the celebrity should be successful. The, so basically, you guys are in charge of whether or not your favorite celebrities are successful. However, as in an interpersonal relationship with your friends, your family, if boundaries are not set, there can be a lot of hazards for the persona. Uh, unfortunately, the Christina Grimmie tragedy, she was a YouTuber who also performed on The Voice. 
Uh, she was tragically killed at a fan meet and greet by a fan who had the mindset of, if I can't love her, no one can. And uh, it was actually very tragic. It happened right before VidCon, so a lot of fans immediately knew about it. And so Hank Green had this to say about the tragedy. Creators really do have a more significant connection with their communities than in other media. Their closeness can be an asset that the fans are more likely to understand the humanity of the creator, but it can also be a liability that they begin to have delusions of a relationship, a significant relationship that more than exists. So how to establish a parasocial relationship? Uh, so this is actually the study I did. I did how to, what traits contribute to strengthen a parasocial relationship between YouTube vloggers and their audience. And I chose YouTube vloggers because they are the ones that benefit the most from a parasocial relationship. They're, the, they're not usually sponsored by these big media companies, they're sponsored by the fans, the fans' contributions to them. So the four celebrities I chose were uh, Lindsay DeFranco, a family vlogger with about 300,000 subscribers, the odd ones out, an uh, animator vlogger with over 3 million vloggers, PewDiePie, which is the most popular YouTube vlogger with over 54 million subscribers, and then Danny Mansuti, a beauty vlogger with around a million subscribers. Uh, so this is the rubric I use to determine out of a scale of 1 to 5 how strengthened their traits were for certain things. Uh, so I focused on relatability, informality, fourth wall, well, I'm going to say break the fourth wall, self-disclosure, routine fulfillment, and the parasocial connection with their audience. And I did this by watching around uh, 100 of their videos, I want to say, and scoring each video on a chart from 1 to 5. And then I would go through the comments of their videos, and I would analyze how strong a parasocial connection is through various things, whether or not the audience uh, connects to them by their calls them by their name, or connects them in another way. Uh, so this is Lindsay Franco. She was actually the most successful at establishing parasocial relationship, and that's because she exposes a lot of her personal life on camera. She follows her son, Trey, who's three years old, around, and shows a lot of his activities, like his struggles with swim lessons, and uh, her husband's new business that he's starting. And so as a result, her audience talks to her as if they know her. Like uh, her son Trey again. Trey is always adorable, but now he was so cute. OMG, uh, Phil is her husband, and she there's comments. Bill calling Lynn's baby is one of the cutest things ever. Like this is not things you say to a stranger, but these people feel like they have the entitlement to say to them because they feel a connection to Lynn's. And then this is the not so good connection. This is Danny Mansuti. She's a beauty vlogger. She is ran by one of the big media companies, and most of her videos are scripted. Uh, and so as a result, she has a lot of zeros across the board. And most of the comments she has are very generic and very like, like, oh, you didn't wear black today. Anyone can not wear black today. That's not anything special. That's not a true connection to the character. Uh, I, like, I love you, Danny. That's, it's again, generic. It's not super specific. So, and the thing with that, though, is that she treats her fans' money more important than her fans. And so my results found that relatability, informality, and acknowledgement of the fourth wall, basically the same thing as Lones and Gal, we're addressing the audience in the second person, uh, is the factors that are most important to emulate in a parasocial relationship. And they basically, they basically want to treat their audience as a friend. They don't want to be more, they don't want, sorry, they don't want your money to be more important than them. And so, Routine fulfillment and levels of self-disclosure only support these traits. And then the more the channel is treated like a business, like Daniel Mansuhi's, the less likely for a parasocial relationship is to form. Uh, so in the end, there's nothing really to be ashamed about for a parasocial relationship, unless you do get to that obsessed mark, which is a little dangerous. Uh, Liebers emulate a lot of parasocial relationships. Uh, football fans, huge on parasocial relationships. So it's, Pretty, it's pretty okay to have a parasocial relationship. It's not nothing to be ashamed of, and there's a lot of benefits for both creators and the audience on that.